The Libertarian Party Mises Caucus was founded for the purpose of principled messaging over pragmatism. In interviews, Heiss is quick to promote his caucus as being a reignition of the Ron Paul Revolution, the revolution that was built on the premise of reaching the remnant, which, in short, requires you to focus on principled messaging. And if you're not familiar with that, these two videos by Drew Hancock explain the concept in detail. It was necessary to form this principled caucus because for many years the LP had been under the control of the Prague Caucus, who were willing to sacrifice the message for the sake of mainstream appeal, citing this as the more pragmatic approach to achieving liberty. A similar cancer has now gripped the Mises Caucus itself, and if it is not rooted out it could set back the liberty movement by years. This cancer is that of the neo-Prags who wish to sacrifice adherence to libertarian ethics out of high time preference and frustration with the cathedral. This is the most urgent problem in intra-libertarian discourse. Whether or not it is addressed, it will determine whether the movement will be characterised by the principles of liberty or impulsive reactions against whatever the enemy does. Where old prags bent over backwards to appease the establishment, neo prags do the same but for the anti-establishment, both at the expense of truth and ethics. <laughs> The most common place where these neoprags detract from libertarianism is in their desire for various government counter-mandates. You will often see them calling for the state to ban businesses from rejecting the unvaccinated or alternatively the unmasked. A parallel can be drawn between this and the anti-discrimination laws that came about in the wake of the civil rights movement in the US. Their general spiel is that while it's not ethical to ban a business from enforcing that you wear a mask or take a vax, this will be a strike against the cathedral and as such it will benefit liberty in the long run. We can put ourselves in the shoes of civil rights advocates in the US in the 60s and use this logic to justify those anti discrimination laws too. The cathedral was, at that time, no doubt anti-black, and as such, forcing businesses to not discriminate on the basis of race would be an equal strike against it, as is forcing businesses to not discriminate on the basis of vaccination status. We can take this further by imagining a hypothetical US, one where the federal government mandated that all businesses must enforce Jim Crow. Would the proper libertarian response be to support states that mandated that no business may discriminate on the basis of race? That hardly seems right. Libertarianism is opposed to all forms of anti-discrimination legislation. This is not only an ethics issue. Expanding the state's ability to regulate freedom of association is a terrible strategy for attaining liberty. If it is possible for states to implement their own mandates, why not simply negate the federal mandate rather than negating that mandate and adding their own mandate on top of it? This is analogous to Walter Block's framing of abortion as being evicting and killing. We can be for the negating of the federal mandate and against the implementation of a state mandate on top of that. <laughs> The neoprag belief that they know when we should go about expanding the state ties into the hubris of neopragmatism. But before I elaborate on that, I ask that you hit the like button if you're also concerned with protecting the liberty movement from subversion. So, this is a similar concept to when Jordan Peterson discussed the narcissism of socialism. Essentially, when I am saying that some previous regime was not real socialism and that my ideas could implement proper socialism, what I am really saying is that I am smarter than those previous dictators, and that if I was a dictator, I could have done it better. A similar thing happens when I say that I can decide when ethics apply and when they don't. I am essentially saying that I am smarter than everyone else. How so, you might be asking. This is because of a second premise they take up, that they don't want others to decide when ethics apply to them. This is the essence of libertarianism, and these people still consider themselves libertarian. The belief that a person or a group of people can and should potentially plan ethics in this manner is called statism, and these people are at least ostensibly anarchists. So what they are really saying is that statism is fine, so long as they are in charge. But if you are not like that and wish to actually remain consistent in your principles, a good test of that is found in the short story, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas. The story is about a perfect utopia, Omelas, a shimmering city of unbelievable happiness and delight. But the maintenance of this utopia requires that a single child be kept in perpetual filth, darkness, and misery. When citizens are old enough to be told the truth, most, though initially shocked, ultimately acquiesce to this as a necessary injustice. Some, however, silently walk away from the city, and no one knows where they go. The man of principle is a man who walks away from Omelas. The high time preference neoprags would sign up to aid in the torture of that poor child. In 1985, Meyer Rothbard wrote an article called on the duty of natural outlaws to shut up. This entire piece was essentially Rothbard calling it the pragmatist of his time, to the same end as this video. He notes that the libertarian status as an embattled minority has led to big tent thinking, namely, that we are indulgent to anyone and everyone who's even tangentially in our ranks, even those who are damaging to the movement. You should think back and try and recall if you've ever fallen foul of this tendency. Rothbard notes that if you abandon natural law, you can no longer call the state an organisation of the criminal ruling class because crime itself is a natural law concept. Neoprags can't even escape this by adopting positivism, the theory that the law is what the state says the law is, as that implies that the state is legitimate in its deciding of the law. So what ground does that leave the pragmatists to argue with? To quote Rothbard, noting that Amadorian refers to George Amador, who believed that the LP of his time was too gradualist and too ideological, sounding quite like our neoprags. The pragmatic radical anarchist is faced immediately with powerful critiques from pragmatic status. He can show, for example, that anarchy would increase production, yield a higher standard of living, etc. in the long run. But in the short run, lots of the privilege, subsidised or monopolistic, would be cast adrift. All these short run, and maybe intermediate run problems, could only be offset by vague future benefits. But why pragmatically should everyone prefer the long run to the short run? What about the high time preference people, who thus challenge the Amadorian. Look here fella, I know the pragmatic benefits I am getting from the current system, and I know too the headaches, disruptions, 
options, the losses that I and lots of others will suffer during the lengthy transition period. Even if you've convinced me that eventually I might benefit, these benefits are too chancy and too long run for me to want to risk it. And if the average person cannot be sold on radical immediatist anarchism, a fortiori, the criminal ruling class, those net beneficiaries of the state, they who may well be losers even in the long run, certainly won't be convinced. At best, the Amador simp will say, well, I admit this anarchism sounds pretty good, but pragmatically, to ease the transition and to minimize the costs that even you admit, let's move towards the ideal very, very gradually, and we are back willy-nilly to the Republican or Democrat party, the master gradualists of us all. It is no accident then that Democrats and Republicans proudly call themselves pragmatists. Sure, they believe in freedom, in peace, in free markets, in all the goodies, but these goals have to be approached, they tell us, piecemeal by the groping push and pull of the democratic consensus, and we're back hip deep in the status quo. Radical pragmatism of any sort, whether anarcho or Camino or whatever, is virtually a contraction in terms. Rothbard notes further that through all of recorded history, pragmatism has never succeeded in inspiring any movement for radical or revolutionary social change. For who would join a radical minority movement and commit himself for life to social rejection and a marginal existence, if not for the sake of some undying principle that takes precedence over any personal desires he may hold? The men and women who shaped history moved mountains out of a deep moral passion. It is ideology, moral values, deep beliefs, and principles that move people. It is no coincidence then that even in the libertarian movement, the people who have stuck to it over the years have been almost exclusively the believers in rights and possessors of moral passion. The libertarian pragmatists, what the Marxists call economists, have generally hived off to good jobs and forgotten any movement concerns. And by their lights, why not? Why not let the crazy ideologues worry about the movement and about liberty? The pragmatists, as usual, will just take what comes. Anarcho-pragmatism, then, simply doesn't work. It cannot push radicalism among the public, and it cannot build a radical movement. All it can do is subvert, weaken, and if unchecked, even destroy the libertarian movement, which the anarcho-pragmatists claim they are striving to strengthen and promote. Objectively, anarcho-pragmatists can only function as wreckers of libertarianism, and since moral passion and ideology work, and pragmatism doesn't, the anarcho-pragmatists have a pragmatic obligation to either convert to natural rights, or at the very least, to pretend to convert, and then use the natural rights and ideology as a weapon with which to build an anarchist movement. Objectively, then, and on their own terms, the anarcho-pragmatists have a solemn duty to surrender, to shut up about their doctrines and abandon the field. Some of it is good people that, that have been fed lies. It is no secret that outlets such as Cato and Reason are not the most principled places on earth. As such, most libertarians have been conditioned to recoil and react negatively to whatever they put out. And you can hardly blame people when takes like these are the standard. But this conditioning has given the neocrags in. People like Pete Quinones are able to paint any old tweet sent by these institutes as being bad, even when they're consistent with libertarian principles. Doing this repeatedly has allowed them to sneak their ideas through the sally port, until we have arrived at the current situation where the majority of responses to a principled reason take are negative. It is my hope that with this video, people will be made aware of the dangerous neo-pragmatism and will know it when they see it and be able to avoid succumbing. But if we remain silent on this issue, it will never die out. Subversion lives in the dark. Do not let people get away with it. Call them out on their incorrect and anti-liberty beliefs. And I mean incorrect in the literal sense. When they reject consistency for the sake of pragmatism, they are objectively incorrect. Consistency is defined as non-contradiction, and via the law of non-contradiction, we can say that inconsistency is necessarily incorrect. Thus, embracing inconsistency is embracing a rejection of truth. So, when you see people on Twitter speaking like like this, just be aware that these opinions are necessarily wrong. We are fast approaching a time when it will be impossible to catch out neoprags with reductions ad absurdum. Normally, what you do to show these people that they hold bad beliefs is you'd ask them something along the lines of, would you kill innocent people to achieve your desired political ends? Which is met with a resounding no in any reasonable group of libertarians. But some neoprags can be seen on Twitter advocating that children be slaughtered and that the families of politicians be coerced. I cannot help but recall a story that Michael Malice tells of Emma Goldman, a leftist anarchist who was deported from the US to the USSR. When she arrived, she was horrified by the many awful things Lenin was doing, and she actually stormed into his office and told him, this is not what we are about. The revolution is about freedom. To which Lenin responded that freedom was a bourgeois contrivance and that you can have freedom after the revolution. Saying that you are living in Ancapstan in your head is common among neoprags. It's used as a version of people that they see as being too principled, saying that neoprags instead live in political reality, and that being an Ancap means you rely on a utopian future which will either never happen or will not happen in the Ancap's lifetime. Danny Duchamp has an excellent defense of the idea of living in anarcho-capitalism in one's head, which I shall be heavily taxing here but you should go and watch the full thing. It is worth noting right off the bat that Murray Rothbard lived in anarcho-capitalism in his head. So too did most of our great leaders. The great Ron Paul hardly acquired the presidency, and even if he had, you are naive to think that he could have gotten anything done, considering the great lengths the cathedral went to to stop someone as unlibertarian as Trump. We are diametrically opposed to every form of political power. They will never be our friends. We are forced to live and to preach anarcho-capitalism in our heads. This is how we reach the remnant. Furthermore, principles are not just intellectual abstractions that don't apply to your life. 
You use principles to inform you on how to live ethically in a complicated world. No man has the capacity to understand all the cogs at play, else he could centrally plan, and we don't think that's possible. Every man must employ aids to his action so that he knows when he's being good and when he's being evil. There's also the snuck premise that living by your principles just leads you to getting run over by those who don't, and that by abandoning principles you gain far more ground. But this is not at all how politics works. You have a negligible impact on any political issue, whether you live by your principles or not. The benefit in living by your principles is that you can look yourself in the mirror and know that you're good. You know that you would walk away from a melas. You know that you would not be the guard at a prison camp. Duchamp gives an analogy from physics, that of the second law of thermodynamics. The law states that in any isolated system, entropy cannot decrease. That is to say that any isolated system will tend to thermodynamic equilibrium. But in reality, we don't see any isolated systems. Every system we come across either has energy coming into it from outside or energy leaving it to the outside. So are physicists living in the second law of thermodynamics in their heads? Is it pointless to consider the ideal case? Of course not. Looking at the ideal case gives you a baseline with which you can analyse the real world and all its messiness. Relating this back to anarcho-capitalism, we could ask whether an ANCAP society would devolve into statism, or rather, would we expect it to? This is the same as asking whether private security firms have a tendency towards monopolization, which any Austrian will tell you is not the case. But that requires us to look at the praxeologic ideal, rather than looking to the real world. Basing economic theory like that on empirical observations is epistemologically flawed. And I think the neoprags know this, yet they base their ethics on empirical observations, surely just as flawed. That is to say, neoprags can be reasonably framed as ethical Keynesians, not just for their empiricism, but also for their high time preference. Neoprags will often share memes of this sort. This is an equivocation tactic. They want people to believe, and perhaps they themselves believe, that they are taking up the position this meme takes. Namely, that it is silly to tell people they are not allowed to complain about the actions of a private company because this is a rejection of preference. But this is not at all what neoprags advocate. They wish to violently coerce rather than peacefully disassociate and criticise companies that do things they don't like. Their frequent uttering of the it's a private company bro meme is an attempt to conflate principled libertarians with the leftist scourge, which sets up a false dichotomy between a principled left and an unprincipled right. It is very much not a good idea to cede the concept of principle to the left, as that is, as I explained above, ceding the concept of being correct to the left. But there is reason to be optimistic in the face of this problem. As described above, there was a neo-prag wave in Rothbard's time that was evidently quelled and did not destroy the movement. And further, there does seem to be some pushback in the Mises caucus against this. Pete Quignone has recently tweeted out that he is withdrawing his support due to a dispute with a founding member. I've also been assured by people in the caucus that the leadership is resolute on principle, so the issue is mostly concentrated in orbiters on Twitter and in various podcasts and the like. This fact allows for a disproportionate utility in publicly denouncing this behaviour, as it has no intellectual backing. To round off this video, I present a prediction. If everything goes the way I hope it goes, and larger names in the space start calling out this cancer, I believe the neoprags will retreat into is just ironic shitposting. Stop taking it so seriously, bro. Neopragmatism can only live in the dark. When large names start calling out their failings, they'll be less confident in their convictions. And as they have no principle to fall back on, they cannot reinforce those convictions. You can aid in achieving this end. If neoprags are publicly shamed, even by small fish, others will catch on. Every time you see statism being snuck through the back door into our movement, loudly and proudly denounce it. This would be the ideal end to the problem. The vanguard could once again get back to vying for liberty and not have to worry about subversion. However, this could just as easily lead to a fragmentation of the movement, analogous to the famous Cato vs Mises split. Only time will tell.